Hey there, a quick reminder that All About Beer is back online. Visit allaboutbeer.com for news, reviews, and beer insight. And you can also follow along on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at All About Beer to keep up with us every step of the way. And if you want to help bring original journalism to the beer space, we have a Patreon that goes directly to writers, photographers, illustrators, and editors, starting at just $5 a month. And there's also a pro tier for all of you professional brewers and industry businesses out there. Visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer to learn more. Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall. With a thoughtful lager program that draws from tradition, Thomas Beckman of Goldfinger Brewing in Illinois is serving up mugs of distinction. On this episode, we're going to talk about ingredients and regionality, and we might actually create a new style. But first, we're able to bring you this show each week, thanks to the companies that want to support independent journalism in the beer space. And you can help us out too. Learn more by emailing sponsor at beeredge.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Stomp Stickers. Stomp is a proud member of the Brewers Association that produces a wide variety of printed brewery products, such as beer labels, keg collars, coasters, beer boxes, and much more. Stomp's website features an easy to use design tool, low quantity orders, fast turnaround times, and free domestic shipping. Visit stompstickers.com and use code BEEREDGE15 for 15% off of your first order. This episode is also brought to you by Cigar City Brewing, the makers of High Low IPA. With vibrant aromas of nectarine, orange zest, and lime leaf that greet the nose, it melds seamlessly with peach-like esters and a light, bready malt aroma. Citrus flavors of clementine and tangerine dance on the palate with a snappy bitterness, and with a bread, crust-like malt, and sparkling carbonation providing balance to this moderately bodied IPA, you can learn more at CigarCityBrewing.com. So it's no secret that I love a well-made lager. And one of the great benefits of this current brewing age is the number of small producers that are producing high quality pilsners and lagers. Goldfinger, located in the Western Chicago suburb of Downers Grove, is one of them. Tom Beckman is the co-founder and brewer and is my guest this week. He has all of the credentials one would want from a proper lager brewer. He has his master brewer's diploma through the World Brewing Academy in Chicago and Munich and built Goldfinger to the specs he wanted, including a decoction brew house, aeration, horizontal lager tanks, and natural carbonation. And there's some family history involved here too. Marcus Goldfinger, a brewer and equipment manufacturer who lived in the 19th century in Poland and sold his wares across Europe, is an ancestor of Tom's. So today's Goldfinger has three core offerings and a host of rotating seasonals. And we're going to talk about it all along with process as well as service. I've been hearing about Goldfinger from several of you listeners for a while now, including Aaron Peterson, who says, quote, his brewery has achieved the please take all of our money status in our household. And his Maybach is one of the best beers I've had in a very long time, end quote. And then Ashley Carter of Beerstadt Lager House reached out and suggested having Tom on. So clearly, the time had come. Here's our conversation. Mm -hmm. We're getting into the warmer months. What's the lager style that you think is ideal for brutal North American summers? Um, The ideal lager for summers for me is a Pilsner. Uh, But maybe it's just because I love German style pills in general, that tends to be my favorite of the beers that we brew year round. Um, If I'm going based off of what our customers tend to flock to uh, during the hot summers, it's actually our Mexican lager um, that we, we initially brewed uh, early. I want to say it was like early 2021 for our friends who opened a Mexican restaurant in our town of Donruss Grove. And the idea was to make this nice kind of pale lager, like hardly any bitterness and uh, brew it with some, some corn and it just took off. So we ended up packaging it and uh, sales. It's funny because sales kind of slow down on that 
uh, beer during the winter, mm -hmm. but we finally had uh, a good stretch of warm weather here in Chicago that uh, now it's typically at least our number one or two seller in the tap room. Is that one of the things where with Mexican lagers, because of the extreme popularity of those very well-known global brands, that it's an easier sell to customers? I, I think so. I think the one of the reasons why the sales dip, because if you look at, I, in general, beer sales kind of dip in the, in the winter, but people are still definitely consuming some of the macro American styles, but I think just decades of one particular Mexican brewery uh, creating this image of this beer is to be consumed on sandy beaches. It's really kind of trained the market to think that the only appropriate time to drink these and mass is during really hot, hot days. So we see that in our tap room. It, it, would it would it be a t I mean I know Chicago winters um, being what they are would would it just be silly to try to have those on in the winter? So in our tap room, we still sell some of it. Yeah, uh, but the only thing is that we we brew it for this restaurant, and when people go to a Mexican restaurant, then all bets are off. They're going to drink the Mexican lager because they're at a Mexican restaurant. So mm -hmm. our, we still sell quite a bit of uh, kegs to that restaurant all year round. Um, what we ended up doing actually this past winter was we brewed a dark version of it, uh, kind of like a Negra. We called it a Negra version of it. Right. Um, and, and that did really well. So the funny thing is that the flavors weren't like, drastically different it was slightly toastier and of course darker in color and that seemed to be enough to uh have our our customers feel comfortable drinking it in the cold months what goes into i i'll preface it by saying this that there is something to be said for small batch loggers where there is a little bit more hardiness to it in my mind, or the, the ingredients shine a little bit more than maybe some of the larger commercial examples. Um, you know, I, I know there's the old trope of, you know, American beers just watered down, but, um, but there is something about small batch lagers that, that seems a little bit hardier. When you're thinking about Mexican lagers, are, are you, are there conversations that have to happen with people saying like, Hey, you might be used to you know, that, that, that beach advertisement brand. Ours is going to have a little bit more body to it, a little bit more oomph to it. Or are you trying to replicate what the larger styles are doing? Uh, we're not trying to replicate We're I would say we draw like inspiration homage. from yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but Ours definitely is deliberately more flavorful. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what we do is look at the general experience that people expect to have with a Mexican lager and see what areas that us as more traditional lager brewers can enhance while not polarizing uh, the, the same people who would drink a watered down version or a less flavorful version. Yeah. So when we, when we develop the recipe, um, we knew that we wanted to have some type of non, uh, barley adjunct, uh, and nowadays it seems pretty commonplace to put some type of corn, whether it's flaked maize or grits or some, some type of corn in there. And I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that people associate corn, like tortillas and stuff with Mexican cuisine, mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is I was just having a conversation with Dusan at Live Oak, who's a, a friend of mine, and we've done a beer together. We're doing another beer together uh, actually next week. And we're both reading the Vienna Lager book. Uh, he's further along in it, but <laughs> he, he, he told me that uh, when the Mexican beers were starting to be produced in Mexico, which were, of course, 
uh, beers that were brought from Austria and uh, and Germany, they were they weren't using corn. They were actually using rice. Uh, so that was news to me. I I didn't realize that. Um, but anyway, to we yeah. when we talk to the consumer about our 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 Mexican lager, we just keep it short and we say like this is a more flavorful version of what you typically like to drink when you drink yeah. a Mexican lager. And and people are cool with that. They they're just like cool, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We um, even managed yeah. to convince some people to drink it uh without a lime well no, we don't come do lime. on yes we do we don't put <laughs> limes in our beer uh at the brewery and for the first maybe four or five months that we released the beer we every day would have somebody like hey you got a lime you got a lime it got to the point where people were bringing little ziploc bags of pre-cut lime wedges and putting them in there in in our beer garden which we were fine with sure uh but but now i think people have just realize look this doesn't need a line um i mean part of me i i'm just gonna stir up some shit now why not give the people what they want <laughs> uh we considered it uh but they're there we decided against it for a couple reasons one it's uh just from like a, a sanitary standpoint that's where from what I know, that's where like the most people tend to get sick from visiting a bar is how that fruit is processed. And uh, we don't really have an area to process it the right way. We don't really have confidence that we could uh, add that into the overall uh, tasks that our, our taproom staff have. So there was that logistical side and then just the purity side. Uh, we do pure beers, beers that we believe where we don't take any shortcuts. And we believe all the time and effort we put into that beer would be sort of bastardized if you have to flavor enhance it with something else. I dig that. That's, um, I, I, it's gotta be interesting though, because people are conditioned from watching those commercials or the general bar experience that they are just asking for a lime. And now that people aren't, has anybody said, but yeah, I'm still missing it or is it just, they're accepting it and they're, 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 they're happy anyway. Like, do you have holdouts is the natural national citrus association standing outside <laughs> with signs or anything, or like, what's the, well, we kind of have a fallback because the restaurant is like only a mile and a half away from us. And okay. it's kind of a good way to help them out and tell people, okay. well, you can go to the restaurant and have their awesome food and they do serve it with a lime if you uh, want. So, okay. So, so people, maybe they're getting their lime fix over there and then coming here to have the freer version. <laughs> I have to admit though, full disclosure yeah, that I went to the restaurant, which makes delicious food and I allowed them to put a lime in it and it was really good. <laughs> did, did you have a flash of like, well, maybe we should, maybe we should do this too. I did. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I, I see what, I see what all this is about. <laughs> we didn't end up doing it and Hey, maybe we will at some point, but uh, maybe it's a good way to differentiate the experience of our beer uh, at, the, at the brewery versus at the restaurant this is this is quite the journey you've taken us on <laughs> <laughs> um when you're talking about vienna's and some of the original recipes um vienna lager is one of your uh three core offerings if i'm remembering correctly uh, along with your original lager yes. and your pills ha have you thought about well, i guess first of all does your vienna have rice in it or corn in it i'm sorry our Vienna does not. Okay. Um, now so, that you know about original or some of the, the earlier recipes, would, would you, are you thinking about changing it? Not ours because ours is more based on the traditional Vienna lager from Europe. Yeah. Uh, not, not the Vienna lager uh, interpretation in Mexico okay. where they were using rice. Yeah. Um, the, 
we do pay homage to the original Vienna, which was the, the style that was brought to Mexico in our Mexican lager. So there is some Vienna malt in that Mexican lager. Um, but our Vienna Vienna is, uh, it's, it's based off of what we believe the analogger might have been, but I don't think it's, I don't, uh, there's an argument to be made that it's not like the exact original recipe because, uh, we, when we brew ours, we like to have a little bit of a darker color. Uh, so we have to put some carafa malt in there to get that darker color. Uh, whereas the original Vienna might not have been as amberish as we make it. It might have been more golden in color. Yeah. But the re- we did that um, for just because I I love the color. Um, I le- I think that it uh, enhances the overall beer experience when you're drinking our Vienna lager. But also we have two fairly pale versions of our lagers, and our our goal is to. Um, get more interest in lager beer in general and and bring more awareness to the fact that there is there is diversity just within the lager realm and we felt that having a color differentiator was going to help uh get more people to buy into that is there general disinterest or unawareness of lager beer in in, in your mind I think there's awareness of a version of lager beer. Of course, there's a global awareness of it. It's right. the most popular style. Yeah. I at least in our area, um it's only it's only recent that people are realizing that there's more than just pale lager out there. There's more than just Pilsner out there. And of course, there's more than just American lager. Cause I think even the the group of people who have been consuming imports for a long time, all those imports are also uh, well. The majority are are pale lagers and typically not not too bitter. Um, so I think that people have this preconceived notion of what lager is and what lager should be, and we like to kind of we're trying to popularize styles that people should like because these same people are drinking potentially ale versions of a maybe roasty beer. Uh, and guess what? There's delicious roasty lager and you might yeah. even like it more because it's going to be slightly drier, a little cleaner, and you might want to have a couple more of those than you would the ale, ale version of it. Um, so that's kind of been our, our, play in this uh market uh we there before us well metropolitan is uh one of the first of this new craft beer movement i think they're about 10 years old now yeah uh that that was focusing on lager beer and uh they've been they're they're in chicago focusing in chicago yeah in chicago yes in chicago um but they So they were doing, they're steady and they've been steady for 10 years now. Um, I wouldn't say that like people were going crazy over their beer. I think the first brewery to put a focus on lager beer in Chicago since the new movement of craft beer has been Dovetail. I've heard of them. Uh, Yeah, they, they, they started kind of bringing more focus into process. Uh, Yeah. And then we, we take that and we go even further to discussing about our process uh, because we've found that people actually like it, whether they understand every word we use in our description of how we produce these beers. uh, I don't think it really matters. I think what matters is that they understand this is why lager, our lager and craft lager is so much different from your preconceived notion of it because we go through this arduous process uh, to get it to where it is. Being a smaller lager brewery, do you, do you think the message penetrates 
to, to, to people, or is this, is this back to the, to the, the very old school days of just hand selling to people? Um, I think that, I guess it depends what you mean by penetrate, penetrate how, how far. Well, I mean, I, and I, well, I guess that's sort of my question is, you know, I, when you're having these conversations with people, it's probably at the brewery or, you know, whenever you're yes. interacting with people, when they have the beer in front of them, because it's going to be hard to go up against, you know, let's just say big lager um, and, and that juggernaut. Um, yeah. So I guess, is it, are people generally receptive of these conversations? And then when you do have the conversation with them, do you, do you think it has a lasting impact where, you've converted people hopefully to smaller batch lockers. Um, I do believe that the message penetrates, uh, mm. but it's to a very specific willing audience. Uh, it's, it's an audience that already values a story values, a premium product um, and has some general knowledge of small batch production of any type of beer. Uh, I don't believe, and it's never really been our goal to try to penetrate a broader market of people who are used to big lager because first and foremost, we'll never compete on, on a pricing level. And right. a lot of those consumers value that too. Uh, so we, we, we kind of hope to attract the people who've, for years been paying a little premium for a an import lager or who like craft beer in general because then we don't really have to worry as much about pricing uh we can start talking about what the what goes into the beer but we've had some we've had some really positive interactions of people not so much anymore because we are are brand recognition has reached a little further than when we first started. So being that all we produce is lager beer, now people uh, associate lagers with our, our brand, with Goldfinger. Um, but in the beginning, we have a big sign on the side of our, our building and there's a major cross over a railway, a metro, metro line that stops right by our brewery. So that was actually drawing people in and they had no clue that all they were going to get were lager were loggers when they walked in. So we had so many people asking for IPAs or looking at our menu and being like, uh, this is all you got. Yeah. Where are your Imperial stouts? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't, and I don't see any puree adjuncted kettle sours on your menu. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we, we had, I wouldn't say a lot, but we certainly had people turn around and leave. Uh, but we, I would say we've had more people find it intriguing. Wow. That's a, that's sort of a weird, weird thing to do. And then the way we did it was to only have three options. We, we, at one point in our early days, we actually went with one beer for two weeks because we were, we couldn't keep up with demand. And of course the turnaround time for lager is very long. So we really had to lean in hard on, uh, this, you're going to love this beer, uh, cause it's all we got. Um, but because we only had three, three lagers at, at the same time at, uh, during you know, maybe a two or three month stint. Uh, it was perfect because people, they're all under five and a half percent. One's under 5%. They're dry. They're highly drinkable. So people would have the first one. Then they'd be curious about the second one. And instead of wondering whether they should have the third one or not, they were like, well, there's only one more on the menu. Might as well have that one. So we were able to get people to try three completely different lagers at uh, almost every visitor that was coming in. So that really helped to 
uh, boost our, our story of lager beer and lagers being different. And because it, it, the, the customer experience was so clear cut, walk in and have three different lagers and you've tried the menu. Okay, more in just a minute, but first, thanks to these episode sponsors, and I hope you'll give them a closer look. Stomp Stickers is a reliable resource for printed items such as beer labels and boxes, keg collars, coasters, and more. Visit stompstickers.com and use code BEEREDGE15 for 15% off of your first order. And thanks to Cigar City Brewing for sponsoring this episode. Tropical and bright flavors and a full palette of flavor and a potency designed with moderation in mind. High low IPA lowers the intensity of a typical India pale ale while maintaining the highest quality and hop flavor possible. Learn more by visiting cigarcitybrewing.com. And now back to the conversation. There's so much choice on brewery menus these days. I, I was uh, hopping around to a couple of places over the weekend. I walked to one place that had 21 different uh, different uh, house made beers on tap. And I, I, I was overwhelmed. Um, uh, by that, and I'm I'm curious as to if it just I, I guess it has to make your life easier to have just three core beers on offer. But does that focus does does focusing on those beers free up space in your brain for other things? Does it does it give you a a, a sense of calm? or at least a, a better handle on the business, having to just focus on basically three mains without worrying about all the other, I'll say chaos, but that, that's, not, that's not necessarily what I mean. Um, does having three beers, does, does it make your job easier or just complicated in a different way? I would say it's complicated in a different way okay. because we are obsessed with <laughs> dialing in process to, to make sure that every glass is exactly the same, which is really hard to do when you don't have a million dollar budget to buy all the equipment that you need to mo- measure every possible thing. So we obsess even just about the three beers. And even though people are saying they love these beers, on the back end, we think that we can either make them more consistent or do very subtle things to enhance the uh, the the flavor of it. Um, I think that, like one example would yeah, be, I was going to say, can um, you give me an example? Yeah, 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 absolutely. One example would be for our original lager, which is our best seller. Um, there, there's some process that we can do. To so it's not a very bitter beer. I would say it's quite balanced between this initial malty sweetness that dries out, and you get a nice kind of um, herbal, somewhat floral uh, hop character on the finish. And the bitterness tends to ride more on the back end of the tongue, but dissipates quickly, uh, which is great. It's an excellent beer, but I think that some we're, we're working right now on uh, changing the process and it has to do with some pH. It has to do with the, the timing of the hops to still give you that same exact quality, but because the way the bitterness uh, reacts with that beer, it'll actually make the beer even more quaffable than it is um, just because of literally a millisecond at the end of drinking it, we want to tweak that millisecond to of, of experience that you have on your tongue to smooth or round that last part out that won't compromise the bitter perception, but it'll be a different uh, quality. So obsessing about little things like that uh, definitely complicates things, but in a really exciting way. Uh, and that's that was our, our whole plan was let's focus. Uh, let's never do more than six beers at once. And let's uh, focus predominantly on three producing three beers and dialing them into what we would consider the, the best iteration of that 
that recipe that we we can possibly produce. And we have a huge advantage because we have to continue to produce those. Whereas when you have a, a, a 24 different beers on tap and you have these beer one-offs or beers that you do once a year, so you're going to have to wait an entire year to make that tweak on mm -hmm. the recipe because you didn't, you weren't very happy or you weren't satisfied with whatever version you put out there. Right. So it also complicates things because we, um, since we have a lot less selection, it's cool because our beer is typically probably fresher than a place that has a ton of options because all of those sell at a much slower rate. Oh yeah. Because they're just, they're just spread out. Whereas ours is so focused that we're busy trying to continue to produce. And we've had to add additional lagering tanks twice now, since we opened just to have the next batch ready earlier than we anticipated, uh, because we're going through that, the previous batch much faster than we thought is so let's talk about, so you've added additional lagering tanks and you're doing it proper with the horizontals. Um, and I know there's probably a wish list of the, the million dollar equipment that you referenced earlier, but your brewing system is, is, is no slouch. You're, you're, you're set up to be a proper lager brewery. Can you, um, without the benefit of being there or video on a podcast I and mean, we don't have to go too far in depth, but, um, in, in everything that I've read about this, this is, this is a fun system that you're working on. It is. It's, it's an awesome 15 barrel system. Uh, I've had the benefit of having worked at two different breweries prior to this. I was working on an enormous scale at Lagunitas uh, in Chicago and then working on a 15 barrel pub style system at Emmett's Brew Pub, uh, also in Downers Grove. So I've had, I've seen both worlds uh, and an, I, I was formally uh, educated in brewing in Germany. So I've seen a different world um, with certain automation, et cetera. Uh, when we, when we decided on the brew house, we, we knew that we wanted to keep it manual. So we, we don't have any automation. Uh, the reason we wanted to keep it manual is just from a romantic perspective as a brewer who had brewed both on an automated or a manual system. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my, my dog is, I don't know if you can hear no, that. No, I can't. That's, that's <laughs> okay, fine. Good. What kind of dog do you okay. have? I have a wire haired pointing Griffon. He's a uh, Dutch hunting breed. Wow. Okay. He, he looks kind of like a German wire haired pointer. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, sorry. I, no, that's fine. Sorry, we got inter interrupted there. Uh, so from a romantic perspective, we wanted to be flipping valves. We wanted to be super hands-on. Uh, so that was, that was something that was important to us, but we also wanted to set up a system that was going to be ideal for producing lager beer. So that starts with being able to perform step mashes, which means that instead of just a uh, 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 mash ton or a mash lauder combination kettle, which is very common. We wanted a separate mash mixer that was steam jacketed so that we could um, perform step match mashes. To us, that was critical for producing or uh, beers on a consistent basis because now you're really controlling what enzymes you're activating and for how long. Right. Uh, we wanted to be able to to perform decoction mashes because two of our three core beers were going to use a decoction mash. Uh, our original lager is a single and our Vienna lager is a double. So we had to have the proper pumps and connections to move thick mash back and forth. Um, so we have a three vessel system. It's a mash mixer, a lauder, a separate lauder ton, and a kettle, a combination kettle, decoction tank, and whirlpool. And then we added a uh, hot liquor tank 
and most importantly, a cold liquor tank because we knew that we wanted to knock knock out the wort at a very cold temperature. Uh, we believe heavily in never allowing the yeast to experience any warmth. So we don't do elevated diacetyl rests like a lot of American brewers do. Like the 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 yeast is always in cold conditions, and that begins with knocking out very cold. Um, we we aerate with sterile air as opposed to pure oxygen uh, because that's the German way. And also at a certain level, adding pure oxygen can be toxic to the yeast. So mm -hmm. we're really trying to create as comfortable as an environment for the yeast as possible. Uh, so then we move over to the cellar and we perform our primary fermentation in conicals. The reason for that is predominantly just to allow us to harvest the, the yeast and repitch it. Uh, so we will do that. It'll be in the uh, primary fermentation for anywhere from seven to 10 days. But at the end of the fermentation, it's not completely finished. We'll close off the valve, stop allowing the CO2 to go to dissipate into the air and collect that CO2 because ultimately we want all the beers to be carbonated naturally with the CO2 produced from fermentation. Gotcha. So we move those, move it while it's still fermenting into our lagering tanks. And on the lagering tanks, we have spunding valves that allow us to dial in the amount of head pressure in the tank so that we can make sure that it solubilizes to the carbonation level that we desire in our, in our beers. And we'll leave that cold conditioning for, uh, anywhere from seven to seven weeks to six months in the case of our Oktoberfest. Uh, so Oktoberfest is, uh, when do you start brewing that? When do you want to, we brewed you wanna, it. yeah, we did that in March. Okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah, we and we so we brewed it in March. We tap it in the end of September or uh, early October. And just this past week, we so we started this thing four months ago uh, to help kind of bring even more awareness to the value of extended lagering, horizontal cold lagering. So we do this first Tuesday of the month thing where we'll pull off. Uh, some some beer from one of our horizontal tanks that's in more of a in a younger state than when we would typically serve the beer to give people an unprecedented opportunity to taste beer as it's developing so we've we will pull the first one we did was our original lager it was a young version i think it was about three weeks earlier than what we typically would serve it at mm -hmm. uh and it's very interesting because the sensory uh, experience is totally different. Uh, the flavor, the appearance, the aroma, everything's different. And uh, the, we'll put it in a cask, we'll put it on top of the bar, and at five o'clock on the first Tuesday of every month, we'll, we'll tap that and give people samples of a, a young version of our beer. Uh, so this past Monday, or Tuesday, I mean, we uh, we did the three month version of our Oktoberfest, and uh, it's amazing how different it is from at the three month point, which is already longer than what you would typically find on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, how different that is compared to our our six month version, and people are really interactive with it. That we have an open discussion about what kind of flavors and differences they're detecting and everybody just kind of gathers around in the tap room and talks about how interesting the beer is at that point. What in your mind as a lager brewer should be the hallmarks of a good Oktoberfest? I don't want to jump seasons too much, but <laughs> there seems to be a renewed interest in the last couple of years um, for Martin for Oktoberfest and 
there's been some larger commercial examples that are out there or imports or anything else like that. But by and large, it seems that more and more breweries are doing Oktoberfest and maybe not doing as many pumpkins. I haven't looked at the data, but <laughs> um, you know, walking the shelves last year, it struck me that there is more Oktoberfest choice than ever before, which could also lead to general market confusion. So as you, as a, a, mm-hmm. a proper lager brewer, what are the flavors and aromas that you think we should all be looking for when pouring into a, to a proper Stein? I think what would help market confusion is first defining what, what style you're trying to achieve when making an Oktoberfest beer, because I see Oktoberfest as two different categories. You have your very traditional Märzen style, the Urmärzen, the Spaten, original Oktoberfest uh, style, which is going to be uh, more alcohol, so closer to 6%, potentially a little bit over that. Uh, it's going to be darker in color. It'll have more of the raisin uh, quality that you could get out of Munich malt with potentially some toastiness and some biscuit. Uh, it's going to be have a, a slightly bigger mouth feel. Um, and it'll end, it should still, regardless of what style you're going for, still have a perception of dryness, whether that's finishing uh, higher gravity and potentially a little sweeter, but there's enough hop balance there that it still dries the palate and encourages another sip. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's literally just super dry, uh, and fit the finishing gravity is dry. I think both styles need to have that perception because the whole point is you need to consume it. Uh, it, the, the, it. You should be consuming a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so I think clearly defining those two categories. Uh, sorry, I didn't even mention the other category, which I would call a fest beer. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. more a style that is trying to replicate what is currently being served uh, in Munich during Oktoberfest, which over the over the years has just become lighter in color, lighter in mouthfeel, uh, and potentially, well, I wouldn't say lighter in flavor, but just a different type of flavor where you're favoring more of the honey notes of Pilsner malt and the lighter end of the Munich uh, uh, malt flavor spectrum. It's lower ABV as well. Uh, and the whole point of course, by these German brewers was to sell more beer. So they dried them out, made them lighter, lighter in color, less filling. Uh, and that's become kind of the more popular style nowadays. Right. Uh, so if you can define the two, that helps market confusion because that could potentially help the consumer decide which version they'd prefer. What we're, we're taking a step this year, and this is the first time I'm announcing it. Uh-oh. Uh, breaking news. <laughs> breaking news. This year, we're going to be serving both styles uh, so that we can help educate the consumer a little bit more about the differences. Um, so, our fest beer will not be lagered for six months. It'll be lagered for the proper time to make it nice and smooth, but it's going to be lower ABV than our normal Oktoberfest, which is a Urmerzen style. And we'll serve them at the same time and see which one people prefer. See, now I'm, I'm going to start researching flights. Um... <laughs> yeah. September, I, is it 28th, I think, maybe, or maybe the 24th, right, the Saturday. Can... Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> let me see what I can do. Um, <laughs> so the brewery name is a, a, a direct link to your family past. Yes. And I was looking at the the future beers section of your website, which I, which, which, which I kind of dig. Are, are these beers that are actually on the schedule or are these aspirational? 
Um, geez, now you're pointing to a to a hole in our website that I don't update as often as I should. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, under the our beer section, you have yeah. uh, seasonal beers. What's coming up? Um, a New Zealand lager. Uh, which is which sounds interesting which is coming up and then your future it's on, beers. it's on tap now actually okay new zealand yeah our future beers list when we first put it out was aspirational okay uh but i think we've done all of those to my knowledge okay uh that are on there over the past we're about to turn to uh next month so roughly over the last two years we've managed to brew those at one point in time so one of the beers that's on here is a polish pills a rotating polish hop series Uh and i'm i'm imagining that that is a nod towards your family's past um and i i'll admit that one of the breweries that i was at last weekend that had a multitude of taps had a polish uh lager on tap and in my mind i was like oh like that's maybe awesome it, like maybe it's smoked you know or maybe it's just like a gradisco you know something along those lines um and it was just a straight up you know polish hopped lager um is this an emerging style is this something you want to be an emerging style and what aside from the hops or is it just the hops defines a polish pilsner well, that's first of all, that's awesome that you you had a Polish lager at a brewery, because to me that sounds like like this is potentially a, an emerging category. Um, <laughs> it takes we, three to make a trend. We need one yes. more. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right that it is a nod to the gold thing, the original Goldfinger brewers, who are my ancestors, who had a brewery in krakow poland also one and lieben inside of prague and czechia back in the 19th century they also made brewing equipment and they distributed hops around the region so we wanted the whole point of our brewery is to revive a family tradition that was lost for for a while um obviously poland uh once the 20th century rolled around, uh, a lot of their, uh, the country went through a lot of uh, turmoil, um, to say the least. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to we're trying to kind of bring light back to an era of our, our family's brewing history. Um, so to do that, when you come to our tap room, there's a whole wall dedicated to just the, some artifacts from our family brewing history. Uh, we encourage people to read. It's mostly in Polish, some in, in Czech, and then it's all translated into English. Uh, but we wanted to do Polish style. So we have done a Grozycki, um, and we will do it again. But Polish hops, in my opinion, just from a brewer's perspective, have a lot of potential in our market. Uh, they they are slightly different in kind of cool ways. So many of them are derivations of the Czech Saz hops, but of course hops are influenced by climate and terroir and have different qualities based on that. And we've found that certain flavors that you might not find in Saz, uh, very prominent are more prominent in these Polish versions of it. So, We started exploring with these hops um, early on and have gotten just have keep going deeper in the in the the rabbit hole. Uh, So we have so many varieties and we want to help bring more awareness to this, these hops. So we actually in terms of future beers, we have not started doing the rotating Polish hop series, Polish pills. We have done a Polish pills. It was our, uh, our anniversary beer last year. Um, but we have not done these kind of single hop or potentially dual hop, uh, Polish pills, uh, series yet. The idea being that we showcase 
the the interesting qualities of of these Polish hop varieties. As far as a a style, I think that it's hard to define because Poland has a kind of weird history of of beer, even though I think it's maybe number four in terms of beer consumption per capita. Okay. Uh, they drink a lot of beer. They're not really known for making beer styles, uh, right. except for Grozitski. That's right. the only one that's actually Polish. Most of these are interpretations of either Czech or German styles. Yeah. So it might be too nuanced to call a Polish lager a a separate category. Um, we call it that because we use Polish uh, hops, but mm -hmm. it's a lot. Our process is very German. Um, yeah, and the malt we use is German malt typically, and the yeast is German. So. We call it Polish pills to bring light to the fact that it's Polish hops, but I don't, I don't think you can really make a Polish category uh, technically. Yeah. I'm just looking up the, uh, so it was Jersey cyclone brewing uh, here in New Jersey that I, that, uh, that, that had it on. And the brief description that I see is that, yeah, they used a traditional Pilsner recipe and sourced uh, Polish Lubelski. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Lubelski hops to give this beer. Yep. Uh, simple, clean, blah, 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 uh, go from there. But yeah, that's, um, so, I mean, but it sounds like what you just described as well. So that's two. We just need a third in order to, <laughs> to get the trend. And then you start petitioning, uh, the great American beer festival and all of the other competitions to create a category yes. and you know, run the, run the table. I mean, if Italian pills can get in, uh, why not? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's that. <laughs> I, the that, wheels are turning now. I, yeah. It's uh, you're going to start you know? <laughs> a guild of Polish Pilsner brewers and the secret society. And I love it. Um, maybe the, maybe the key to it is that it, you have to somehow incorporate some pickles and rye bread, and it has to be served with a, a shot of vodka as well. And then that's a, that's like a whole experience you define it as a Polish, uh, Polish lager. Okay. <laughs> like a shot of vodka on the side. You're not talking about like a boiler maker or something, right? It's not, no, you're not dropping no, on it the in. Side. Okay. On the side. So you take a bite of the pickle, right? You shoot the shot, take a bite of rye bread and then finish it off with a sip of a, uh, German Pilsner with Polish hops in it. And then that's, the Polish lager experience. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm down like that is, <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. Um, <laughs> but see, but here's my, here's my problem with this though, is you just said, take a sip of the lager at the end, which means that you've, you might have some pickle left. You might have some rye bread left, <laughs> but the vodka is going to be gone. So if you wanted to, this is like a one-time deal unless now, another shot comes in its place. Uh-huh. Well, in true Polish fashion, of course, another shot comes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make the best business sense, but again, I'm, I'm here for it. So I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> going to get on that plane now and, um, and then Uber back to the airport afterwards, but uh, on the there show <laughs> for the last, uh, for, for, for the last bit, I've been asking people about the green door uh, and the, 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 the premise is on the television show, The Good Place, there's a concept of being able to walk through a green door and be any place at any point in time with whoever you want. And so if such a door was around on this plane of existence and we could end this conversation and you could walk through it and be at any brewery at or any bar any place in the world at any time with somebody that you wanted to be with, where would you go? What would you want to be drinking and who would you want to be drinking with? Um, that's pretty easy for me to answer. Surprisingly, I would think that that, that would be difficult, but, uh, 
I would want to bring my family, my wife and my daughter to a place that was magical for me, which was at the Tegernsier Brewery in the Alps in Bavaria, uh, where I drank a Pilsner that was the best, arguably the best beer I've ever had. Um, and you're just sitting on this serene lake with this, with mountains all around you. It's an experience that I had without them when I was in brewing school in Germany, but it's something that would only be enhanced by their presence. So that's where I'd like to go. I love it. Um, it sort of brings me back. I usually end it here, but you, you made me, you made me think of one more thing of the importance of the right beer at the right place at the right time. And when I was talking about you know, beers for summer, there, there are some beers, you know, we would call them lawnmower beers sometimes that just taste better after a hard day's work or, um, you know, the beer tastes better at the ballpark when your team is up or, you know, wh wh whatever it is, you know, the people that you're yeah. with, the, com the company that you keep. Do you think about that with your beers and where outside of the tap room you hope they're being enjoyed or how they're being enjoyed? I do all the time. I think I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's, I understand why people often ask like, what's your favorite beer or what's, what's your favorite style. But to me, there is that element of environment uh, and place and time that really defines what is your favorite beer. So I don't know that you could say that every day X beer is the best beer. Uh, it right. really depends on, on the place and time. And our Pilsner is exactly that it's, I haven't had the Tegern Zero Pilsner, which was the one that I tried to essentially mimic in our Pilsner recipe. I haven't had it in several years now, and I'm willing to guess that it actually is quite different from what our pills is because when I had it and the idea of the inspiration for it. Uh, came after months of just drinking liters of, of Hellas. And then you have your first Pilsner after drinking liters of Hellas. It has more hot character, more, it's a little drier, a little lighter mouthfeel. And that specific moment when I had that is what inspired our Pilsner recipe. Uh, so I think that about that all the time when we were distributing our beer and when I hear somebody tell me like, oh, this, I loved your pills at this moment. And then they say, I don't know, it's kind of between our, your Hellas or your pills that is our favorite. I often just assume that it's completely environmental at that point. Um, and that's great. We want to brew beers for, uh, for those types of occasions. Uh, we don't want to just brew a beer that we expect you to drink all the time. We want, we want to have, we want to provide options for you depending on the day and depending on how long the grass was, it took forever to mow. Now I want to go have a beer and sit outside. <laughs> Me too. I'm looking outside and it's actually a pretty nice day today. So, well then maybe <laughs> that's, I, I think that's probably our cue. Um, Tom, thanks for being on the show this week. Thanks for uh, bringing us into the brew house and, making us making us thirsty for loggers that exist and and the ones that are on the way as well but I, I i really appreciate your time thank you it's been really nice talking with you okay quick reminder that the craft brewery cookbook is now on sale where books are sold get a copy today and all about beer is back online go to allaboutbeer.com to catch up with great content you can keep in touch with me questions comments guests suggestions Email me. It's John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L -L at BeerEdge.com, or you can get with me on Twitter at John underscore Hall. And check out Beer Edge for all of our This Week in Rauk Beer and Defend Pilsner merch, and follow along on social media at The Beer Edge. And of course, This Week in Rauk Beer is also online. The Facebook group is easy to search, and on Twitter and Instagram, it's at TWRaukBeer. 
We're able to bring you the show each week thanks to the companies that want to support independent journalism in the beer space. If you would like to learn more about our surprisingly affordable rates, please reach out to sponsor at beeredge.com. And speaking of that, today's episode is sponsored by Stomp Stickers. Stomp is a proud member of the Brewers Association that produces a wide variety of printed brewery products, such as beer labels, keg collars, coasters, beer boxes, and much more. Stomp's website features an easy-to-use design tool, low-quantity orders, fast turnaround times, and free domestic shipping. Visit stompstickers.com and use code BEEREDGE15 for 15% off of your first order. It's also brought to you by Cigar City Brewing, the makers of High Low IPA. Vibrant aromas of nectarine, orange zest, and lime leaf greet the nose, melding seamlessly with peach-like esters and a light, bready malt aroma. Citrus flavors of clementine and tangerine dance on the palate with a snappy bitterness with bread crust-like malt and sparkling carbonation, providing balance to this moderate-bodied IPA. Learn more at CigarCityBrewing.com. As always, a reminder to check out the Beer Edge podcast with Andy Crouch. Still, this beer has new episodes every Monday, and the BYO Nano podcast comes out on the 15th of every month. And go visit allaboutbeer.com. As for this show, Mitch Weber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer.